Hello and welcome to That Tech Show, the show that reveals the magicians behind the magic that is everyday technology. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Sam, and good morning, listener. Of welcome. Course. Thank you for joining us today. A little later than usual if you're listening right as we speak, but just to uh, you know, bring it up to how fresh this is. I was uh, going to say. Yeah, I, I've I've just been watching uh, the the, uh, the the Formula One testing at Bahrain and Mercedes arriving with no side pods, so that will date the show for you, and uh, it's very <laughs> exciting. But that wasn't what I was going to talk to you about this morning, and to the listener. What was you going to talk to us about? <laughs> well, also the Mac Studio came out this week, didn't it? Oh, yeah. Amongst other things. You've oh, been yeah. watching that, though, haven't you? I have, I have. I'm even wearing, the listeners won't notice, but I'm even wearing my M1 Mac Pro t-shirt. I'm such a, such a fanboy. I'm such a sheep. And I here's me she... thinking that you were wearing a, a BMW shirt. No, that's 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 <laughs> a play on uh, graphical devices, that is. It looks like a BMW shirt, but it's not. Oh, I see, I see. So yeah, Mac Studio, it's, um, it looks like a tasty little machine, but it's it's quite expensive. Isn't it just? I mean, I've been desperate for this because my mm. Mac, one, Mac, Mac Mini M1, great machine, you know, despite all of the difficulties that you have running things like Docker with it and it not you know, complying with other types of software, brilliant machine, but can't really handle the 16 gig of, um, of RAM. It needs more. It mm. needs more. Mm. So I've been desperate for this machine and I'm quite disappointed at the price of it. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have everything, don't you? I mean, it's two grand starting price. Is that the one you mm. need or would you go even further? Uh, I did. I mean, the, the interesting thing I thought was that the, the M1, um, what's the M1 Max? Is that, is mm-hmm, it, mm-hmm. am I getting that right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the ultra chip is basically two of them stuck together. Yeah, fused together. <laughs> so it acts as though it's one chip, which is yeah, which is pretty cool. I mean, that seems a bit too fu- too much for me. I don't think I need that much as no. much as I would like it because I think this is the thing when you shop at, at Apple, you kind of keep stretching your budget, going, oh well, maybe you well, know, once you've it'll spent last me a bit so longer, much, it's you know? like oh, two hundred quid here, five hundred quid there. It's nothing really. You've been anchored at such a high price, but. Um, but yeah. because of that, it kind of it, because it's two chips stuck together, the price is almost double for the ultra version. Mm. Yeah, still making a sweet little bit of profit because they've doubled it, but they don't have to spend any more on the chassis or the components. It's just yeah. literally the chip itself. So they're uh, yeah. making hefty, healthy profit margins. And then you think about the fact that they just put the M1 chip, which is the same M1 chip in your Mac Mini, they just put that in an iPad Air. Do you know what I mean? So you think, <laughs> and then similarly with the studio, the mm. um, monitor that's that came out with the the, the Mac Studio, that is this basically an iMac without a computer in it. Yet they're charging three yeah, times, two, twice the price or whatever it is. I think it's fifteen hundred, and you could get an iMac for. I read something about them having a uh, an iPhone chip in the monitor. Is that right? So that, yeah. So for the camera, because um, it's oh, doing some, right. the camera's doing some processing. So then there's the question of well, if the chip if the chip fails or whatever, I'm not sure how what's the failure rate on these chips. But if the chip fails, does that mean you've got a dead monitor then? Who knows? Mm. Um, lots of questions. But it's uh, yeah, some healthy profit margins being had. Well, yeah, it always seems just a little unreasonable, doesn't it, in terms of the the, the price? It's just. It's just a little bit out of reach. It, that's, that's the mm-hmm. problem. I will say, though, I was literally thinking about it this morning. I will say, with with all the kind of different things that I do um, creatively and, and all the rest of it, like, my life is on this laptop. And, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a small price to pay to enable you to do what you need to do. The money, you, the value that it creates is, is unquestionable, really. Yes, it's a, it's a lot of money up front, but you've paid for it, you know, doing, doing, doing what we do. We've paid for it, you know, in a couple of months. You know, um, it's, th- these are our lifeblood, these machines. So it's important it's to true. kind of recognize that value. But still, it's still, you know, I did not get the M1 Max 16 inch laptop you know i did get the pro pro represent uh pointing to my t-shirt there <laughs> it works really well on audio that by the way actually. yeah <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah it's uh it looks cool though i think the 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 ultra the m1 ultra is the only one that comes with the two usb c's on the front because obviously you're able to mm. double the amount of peripherals you're able to attach to it but um I'm not quite sure about that one yet, but so are you going to get it then? Are you, are you, I don't know. I mean, I actually looked at my, um, M1, uh, mini, mm-hmm. uh, to see how much they would give me for trading mm-hmm. and the 1200 pounds I spent less than a year ago 
is uh, is worth three hundred and thirty pounds from Apple. Oh my so, god! Yeah, I mean that's awful, isn't it? So there is a chance that there is an M1 Mini going up on up for sale on eBay, or if anybody on the podcast would like to buy <laughs> an M1 Mini, then I'll give it to you for a grand, yeah. and then I can go and. Um, or maybe drop another I don't know it's it's an awful lot of money to go and go well actually I'd have to drop another grand on top mm. of that but at least you've um, got the mi- mouse and you know keyboard yeah and stuff. there is that I mean once you've got the peripherals you know I've got a monitor it's not an M- it's not a Mac monitor I don't think you need it um it's just the power of the of, of the M1 um the M1 chip is is amazing I just needed more RAM and really 32 would be fine so uh, 64 is going to be even better so I think that's probably what I'm going to shoot for but it's probably going to be a few months before I build up to actually uh, pulling the plug on it mm-hmm. <laughs> um, anyway I've got one more thing to talk to you about um, listener and Sam <laughs> uh, have you seen this thing uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a Twitter account called Facebook's Top 10 and I think this is really interesting. So There's a Twitter every, thing called Facebook's Top 10? Yes, so it's a Twitter okay. account. It's called Facebook's Top 10. You can go and look at that handle. Uh, it's all one word uh, in traditional fashion. And they're using CrowdTangle as a source. And CrowdTangle is a Facebook or Meta, I suppose, owned company, I believe, that gives you information about um, all of the, the, the usage on Facebook. And so Facebook's Top 10 every day publishes a te- top 10 list of the highest um, performing posts ranked by interactions. Mm. Now, what's really interesting is if you compare the top 10 posts from before the Russian invasion of Ukraine to after where we've had the sanctions on Russia and we've had Russia as recently as this week or yesterday, I think it was, Wednesday, um, maybe even Tuesday. Oh, well, anyway, this week, that Russia have um, have banned Facebook as well. There is a sizable shift in the popularity from extreme right-wing content that was popular on Facebook. And this is the likes of The 98%, Sean Hannity, Fox News, Newsmax, Breitbart, Ben Shapiro, to what you might expect as more of a balanced mix that you would expect in a general population of actually left-wing, right-wing, reputable news outlets, and actually just non-political content, Mm. uh, entertainment content. So there's things like Forbes, Occupy Democrats, Variety, Reuters, NPR, and then Franklin Graham, and there is the odd Ben Shapiro thing creeping in there. But it's a massive shift from where it was before to where it is now, and I think that's probably the effect, or it's, you know, surmised uh, not by uh, just me but other people that this is the effect that the russian bot farms were having on social media it's a huge change so let me get this straight so before russia basically were not using or not allowed on facebook the the sort of trends and things like that that were bubbling to the surface were Oh, it was significantly right wing, and I think you know we'll, we'll talk about this in the uh, in the show coming oh. up. I think, or, or at least in the next few shows, because we've got a couple of um, shows that we've recorded that focus quite heavily on cyber security, mm-hmm. and uh, including today's, mm. um, which we'll get to in a moment. But the um, the thing that I think is really interesting is that you know if you look at the fact that we're heading you know pretty drastically into a World War Three, arguably you could say that we've already been in it for quite some time because of all of the interactions that are happening to sort of destabilize mm. the, um, the the sort of the global population. I was going to say economy, but it's not the economy. It's not. Um, it's, just, it's just the whole population. Like we've been split down the middle between left and right wing in most Western countries. Mm-hmm. Um, there's been an uprising in popularism, and this is, uh, uh, you know, th- there's been a lot that's been written about um, uh, about about Russia creating bot farms. There, you know. Uh, passion that they have for propaganda and misinformation and it might not seem like it's a, it, it's a Russian driven thing or it makes much sense for them to be doing this but the rise of that sort of um, extreme right wing content it, uh, it it creates this this destabilization, this especially on on Facebook, which is predominantly now used by the older generation who are getting a lot of their news through this source 
um, they believe what they find on there. You know, anyone who's got parents <laughs> um, will know that this is how 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 they consume their news. Um, it's massively destabilizing, and so you know, this has been a, 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 a you know a plan from Russia for a while and you know arguably mm. it's it's to create this type of destabilization to allow them to be in a position to invade a country and to actually have um split decisions around the world on whether they're doing the right thing or the wrong thing you know as recently as yesterday are the chemical weapons was there some sort of plot that america was working on with ukraine to attack russia mm. obviously they weren't but the fact that they can now throw it up in the air there's this there's this thing of like well what is truth you know, it's all part of the plan that kind of fits into the 1984 George Orwell um, uh, sort of narrative of, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. the Ministry of Truth. It doesn't really, you know, a- anything could be true. And this is how you end up with this destabilization. I just think it's fascinating, the yeah, shift, really the impact that it has from you, the Russian money that's paying for all of these adverts and things. Like, you wouldn't expect right-wing stuff to go away completely, obviously, because we're naturally split between left and right wing. But the impact that it has when you take it away and all of a sudden the top posts become balanced, that's very interesting. Mm. Appropriately following on from the uh, effect of the uh, Russian bot farms have on our social media, who have we got well, today? this week <laughs> we have Laurie Ullman. Uh, who is co-founder of Cyber X Security. Uh, so this is a very topical episode, despite being recorded before the war broke out in Ukraine. So we'll be talking about cyber attacks, hacks, and his role in establishing the NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence from his time as the Secretary General for the Estonian Ministry of Defense. Yeah, well, it is, it is a great honor to actually have such a huge guest on the show. And... Um well, we without spoiling the surprise, we have a lot more in store. So um, it's great to talk about stuff that's so critical as well on the show. So um, quite honoured in that respect, and so current. So without further ado, here is Laurie Allman. Hello, my name is Laurie Allman. I'm uh, a member of the board and co-founder of uh, Cyber Service Technologies. Uh, we built the uh, cyber ranges, which basically is to give our customers an ability to, uh, to train, to test, and uh, prepare their companies, organizations, uh, fight cyber threats. I'm, I'm not a tech person originally. I, I, I think I should get that apology out at the very beginning. I'm a lawyer by education, uh, but now that means we are allowed to do all the lawyer jokes in the, in the show. Um, and uh, and I started as a, a civil servant and, and diplomat. My one of my first foreign postings was Kiev, Ukraine. I was 19. I was working in a consulate, basically customer service. And and from there, here I am in a, in a tech company selling cyber ranges. How how does one find oneself as a civil servant working as a diplomat age 19? Was that was that the plan? It was not. Uh, actually, what happened was um, I, it was a summer internship and uh, I was in the, in, the, in the second year of law school and I, I just applied for a, a su- summer internship and they just couldn't find workforce uh, to fill certain positions in Kiev uh, embassy. At that time, it wasn't a popular uh, uh, posting. Well, I think that's the case also these days, but uh, of course, I'm under different, uh, much sadder circumstances, but I think it was 1995 at that time. But but things transpired from there. So um, ultimately, I moved to our Brussels embassy, from there to our Ministry of Defense, I started working on our NATO accession uh, package, and then... Um, Ended in ended up in, in Georgetown Law School. Credited that as well. So I have two law degrees, which again I should apologize. I think you know, on the tech show. <laughs> and then um, I I sat for a New York State bar, and I was I was ready to to start as an attorney somewhere in a corporate office when I when I was made an offer to to become a permanent secretary of defense in in Estonian MOD. And that's sort of a once in a lifetime uh, opportunity. And, uh, and I, I took it, year was 2004, and, uh, and very, very consequential for all the 
from the cybersecurity perspective, because that was the time when we started to see that uh, our reliance on, on e-services, uh, digital society, because Estonia had, had made it pretty, pretty long steps already in, in, in that road, could be dangerous. So what we did in 2004, we, we did rounds with, with NATO member countries proposing to open a NATO center of excellence on cybersecurity uh, in Estonia, because we thought that this is going to be the next new threat. And, and as I was preparing for today's show as well, I went through my notes and uh, the first briefing from our proposal, it came back and they said, NATO doesn't see, none of the NATO allies see cyber in their toolbox or a, as a problem. And the point two was they also don't find any funding for the center, so we need to fund it on ourselves. And uh, that was my, I, I, I mean, although it was government money and, uh, and it was uh, sort of the whole process of, of budgetary planning, I think that was one of the greatest startup investments that the government could do because the, the whole government decided, okay, we are going to front that money on our own, a student taxpayer paid for what later would become NATO Center of Excellence on Cybersecurity, which currently sits in Tallinn. And, and of course, it was timely because 2007, we had uh, a cyber attacks uh, against, against Estonia. And again, that was a fun journey. And we can talk about that as well, although I hate to, to delve too much on, on old war stories. Uh, and because, you know, they get more and more, they get excited. They, they get more exciting by time. I, I, can, I can promise you. <laughs> and one's role in them always increases. So, uh, but, uh, but it was, uh, it was an interesting moment because we had to go through, I think we were the first country who had to go through the hoops of, trying to explain what happened to the world, trying to convince that maybe they were Russians and maybe this is important and maybe this is something that other countries are going to see. And maybe, you know, they didn't, maybe even though it was just a DDoS against a couple of government websites, uh, it is still consequential because maybe they are trying something out here that everybody else should pay attention. And um, we were the first government to talk about cyber and to talk about cyber threats and attacks against cyber against cyber targets, uh, we were not the first government by far to be attacked. But the other governments had classified everything that happened. We declassified, I would say, ninety nine percent of what happened, and we were we were being used as as an example of of this new threat. Well, that's pretty fascinating. Yeah. So you were saying that what was it two thousand and four or two thousand and five? You said. 2004, we started to notice something is going on, and and then then we made a proposal to to start paying attention. That went nowhere, uh, but but we started investing uh, on our own, and we had, of course, we had some allies uh, who who working closely with us. We we had one nation represented in the center that wasn't still recognized. That was largely funded by Estonian government. We couldn't I, we couldn't disclose who the nationality was, but when 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 the guys sat down and, and started speaking in the sort of perfect New York accent, then everybody could see what the nation was who was supporting us that was also. So I'm I'm curious if if NATO were unwilling to get behind setting up the center of excellence at that time because they didn't see it as a threat, how were you convinced that it was a threat? Did you just deal with the information differently or had you had you passed it in a different way or is it is it the the uh, the nature of being a diplomat that some people are going to disagree and some people aren't? I think we had a very wide consensus in the government. I think we had extremely high awareness uh, on cyber uh, in the government because at that time, Estonian foreign minister and uh, later our president Thomas Hendrik Gilvest, uh, who was who was largely behind uh, what was called the Tiger Leap uh, in Estonia, uh, he proposed in the in mid nineties to start equipping Estonian schools with with computers. Uh, computer classes were were not so so much heard about in in other countries. So we, we started computer classes in nineties uh, in Estonia, and and that drove our our digital society. So we already by that time we had very extensive e-services. I think uh, we had um, 
online taxis, we had uh, all kinds of uh, forms. Uh, basically, the communication and services provided by the government were, were online to a very large extent already that time. And and we were just, uh, I think we were just looking at the threat uh, differently. And, and we saw that this is something that is coming. Not to mention, mention the business surface uh, in, in Estonia. Lots of online businesses going on already at that time. Uh, I mean, uh, good and bad. I think uh, around that time, Skype was starting to take off. I think it took off in 2006, 2007. But, but I mean, the people were, were already there and, and why they're thinking. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it was already there. Is Skype Estonian in origin, is it? Skype is, uh, I think, legally it's Danish origin, but uh, some of the original programmers and, and team members and, and I think also what you can call founder, co-founders are, are from Estonia, yes. I think I've, I've forgotten where it originated from in the mist of, mists of times. Now, it's, uh, is it still even published as a, as a separate piece of software? Is it, is it folded into Teams? I think it might be. I think it's I think it's Microsoft now. Yeah, well, it was well, it was definitely. It, I remember it being bought by Microsoft, but I think it, I'm not even sure if it's a standalone product anymore. I'm gonna have to look that up. I think it, I think it is. <laughs> I think it is. So, I mean, I think that's a really interesting journey. I mean, from from going from uh, from taking in two law degrees, did you? Um, uh, at what point did you become sort of interested in the cybersecurity stuff? Was that only through that through that defense role? Or were you, because of the way that the, con- the country was dealing with stuff, were you already interested in technology at that point? I was interested in, when I w- was working in Brussels in 1998, uh, I was working in Brussels and, uh, and actually Belgian Defense Academy in Brussels had these lectures on the future of warfare. And, uh, and uh, I was very inspired by one of the lectures given by Steve Metz, uh, who was uh, um, uh, from U.S. I think he was from U.S. Army War. It, it was an American expert uh, uh, dealing with uh, future war studies, and and he was talking about the, how the warfare is going to evolve and and how the the, the cyber security is also going to be a part of it. But then further, we we when we started our legal work, we had a. Um, a, 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 a series of seminars on, on all kinds of legal aspects that uh, that defense cooperation might um, might involve, and uh, cyber started to come up more and more. So um, it's, um, for example, we had a seminar on NATO status of forces. Basically, what a country should do when a, a bunch of NATO forces passes through. And, and somehow, uh, cyber issues, I, I don't remember exact context, but they started to come up. And then we, then we started to look at the, um, the, the journal articles. Um, one of them, and, and I think it was widely believed in, in the beginning of 2000s, that cybersecurity problem is going to be the next big problem. And if you look up, then there was the Army War College magazine. It, it's, it's called Parameters. Um, and in their September or is it August 2001 number, there was an article about uh, the attacks against Pentagon that they allege uh, originated from perhaps uh, St. Petersburg. It was called Byzantine, I think a Byzantine maze uh, was, the, was the code name of the attack. And, and that was the sort of call for, uh, for attention. Um, but if you once again remember that the date that I said, September 2001, was when it was published. Then that's when 9-11 happened. And the whole military discussion overnight moved to desert warfare, counter IEDs, um, uh, insurgency. So the, the cyber discussion, and we have, we have discussed this with, with experts, uh, from that time, from 2001, after the horrible and tragic events, of course, um, was buried under the, under, under, under the other types of counter terrorist, uh, discussions and, and didn't get that attention until 2007 when, I think when it when we uh, Estonia as 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 country and the Estonian government put it uh, fair squarely back in the agenda, so it was there, but it was dormant. So this is obviously the beginnings of you know cybercrime, cyberterrorism, and, and 
various aspects like that. Given that we are, you know, I mean, gosh, like 15, 15 years, 20 years away from those those sorts of uh, conversations, has it manifested in the ways that you predicted back then or that you'd obviously in those early days, you wouldn't have known, you would have, wouldn't know how things would have manifested. So uh, has it happened quite predictably and in the ways that you imagined or is it kind of changed and there, there are things that you didn't foresee at all with regards to cybercrime? We couldn't. I think one of the one of the factors nobody couldn't uh, couldn't foresee is the use of uh, you know tablets and cell phones and uh, basically computing power that everybody carries with them in, in the beginning of two thousands. That's something. There was something that was ignored. I think there's the famous report of the future threats of cyber from I think it was from two thousand and six that completely ignored the rise of iPhone and of course. You know who who could have uh, predicted that, but uh, uh, but that, that that's an uh, of course the whole data metaverse uh, the commerce com- commercialization of the threat is is something that is uh, that is something I think we still don't quite understand, and then um, also the level of activity on one side on on nation states. And the sheer aggressiveness of it, but I think um, a lot of it is rooted in our initial failure to hold some of those first attempts, um, to hold them uh, responsible for some of those first attempts, like like 2007. I think, I mean, what what we did, what we did well after that. We started talking about it. We started developing cybersecurity strategies. We started to to put that. Um, um, to pay attention, uh, I think that that went well. But still, we had to go through all kinds of, uh, I, I, to to my mind, uh, a little bit of unnecessary high burden of proof that uh, something more sinister is going on. So yeah, I think I think that's that's some of the failures. Mm. And was it a very coordinated effort between everyone in those early stages as well, or was there a bit of a you know, a bit of rough and tumble to try and be the nation or the country or, or whatever, um, or department even that that figures it out or or you know, or was it very coordinated? You all took it very seriously and were like, how can we solve this or prepare for this together? It wasn't uh, that coordinated, but but it's like with every new project or every new. There's this. Uh, what are the phases? The, uh, the 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 forming, the storming, uh, and then. Uh, Whatever the two, the rest of the two stages are, uh, never gotten to them, so I, I don't know. <laughs> norming, <laughs> norming is definitely one of them. Yeah, norming, norming, yes. <laughs> and then performing. Yeah, and then performing. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know anything about that. But uh, <laughs> but uh, but sure, uh, it's um, it was certainly difficult, and it it, it is now, and, and now we are in this norming phase. Uh, and I think to come back to your question, I think this is something that we might 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 get seriously wrong, because people do not understand technology who make laws. And I I say that as a lawyer, we are looking, for example, in United Nations at the uh, on, on creation uh, of of cyber norms, and. Uh, I, I think it's very important, and I think all of this cyber diplomacy and uh, and all those initiatives are extremely Im- important. But I think we have to be mindful how technology works, and sometimes when we try to regulate it, and when we try to overimpose certain regulations on, on or when we think we know how one or other, another thing uh, works, then then we usually can can get stuff wrong, and we might get. And, and create sort of free lanes or, or, or give free passes to some of those countries who are not so eager to follow those norms. So what happens is very much like with free trade. I think I always uh, throw this parallel with free trade and cyber regulation. So there are countries like, I don't know, Canada and United States who actually go to court and discuss I don't know, phytosanitary rules of a meat product crossing the border. And they do it in all seriousness because that's the law and there are certain rules that uh, that need to be applied. The same discussion between China and the United States is wholly political. 
it, it, it has nothing to do with rules. These rules are being used just to advance your exports and block imports of other countries. So we might get that in cyber as well if we if we think too much legalistically here and, and, and don't take into account the political reality that there are nations who are simply uninterested in following those rules and, and rather see other people follow those and then break them uh, altogether. I think this is a pretty fascinating topic, and it's an area that I've been interested in for a very long time. Maybe you can clear some things up, because yeah, sure. <laughs> because <laughs> well, of course, I think specifically as a as a as a lawyer as well, because I I was frustrated a few years back. Obviously, I think a lot of people who listen to this podcast and um, and just in general as a, as a developers or project managers or whatever in software companies have had to deal with the fallout of things like GDPR. And before that, all of the uh, the cookie laws and things that came out have changed changed the face of the web, but probably not as drastically as we initially thought they would. But I, what what I find interesting about it is the lawmakers, as you say, that are making these laws without having that knowledge of technology. And you only have to look at like the um, the, the the Senate uh, disposition. Uh, was, was it disp- um, disposition? Um, the Senate interviews of mark zuckerberg and how embarrassing they were deposition yeah a, absolutely. De- deposition disposition i was saying but deposition you're absolutely right that's why we've got a lawyer on the show um so <laughs> <laughs> correct my my uh, language but yeah absolutely i think it was embarrassing watching that like it was like people love like the uh, the cringeworthy comedy of ricky gervais really you you actually only have to watch that and it's far worse the reality and it's, it's terrifying but yeah I, I i did some research a little while ago to look at okay who in politics actually has any background in computer science at all and i think i, I looked at all of the meps all of the british mps and all of the representatives in in, in the houses in america and I think I found one person who had a computer science degree, which was David Davis. Um, and his was from 79, I think, when punch cards were all the rage. So, you know, the government is always so far behind on those things, and yet we rely on them so heavily. They're weirdly behind, yet also ahead. So uh, it's a combination of, I think there's no, I mean, when... Now I have been working uh, closely with, I mean, 10 years with with really great technological team that we have here in cyber technologies. I mean, this is one of the world top teams on on cyber exercises, on, on cyber ranges. And when I see them work and then how they you know, live in the matrix, so to speak, <laughs> it brings some humility, uh, at least also to my worldview when I talk about law. The sort of the confidence that, uh, that is being displayed and uh, and 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 put out is uh, is, is is scary. Uh, absolutely. Now we regulate AI, and we we regulate AI according to I understand the, the European Convention of Human Rights or something like this. Because, but, but the the problem is that we even don't understand AI. We even don't understand all the implications, and we even don't understand the implications what that regulation might do. I'm talking about uh, all kinds of um, neutrality requirements that now are, are, are put forward with uh, with with uh, EU. Uh, it's it, it's I mean as a goal it, it is great and noble, but it sometimes it just doesn't work like that, and uh, and and that's the problem. There is other side to the coin, and uh, and I, I call it as an interface problem, uh, which is that sometimes when I as a lawyer ask a question uh, from from technical personnel they just may not get me uh, because my my goal might be different i will again i don't want to talk too much about the 2007 because we had lots of good examples from there it's it it it, it may maybe it's worthwhile i went to the um, to our technical team who was preparing the defenses, the cyber emergency response team. Five de- technicians were sitting behind the tables. I was permanent secretary of defense. And I asked them, um, can you tell me from how many computers during that attack, because it was a, a large button at the collection of buttons, from how many computers we were attacked? And everybody in the room started to laugh, who are, and they are techies. And they said we have freely free communication. So that was uh, that that was a great thing. I said you're, you're stupid. You you don't understand technology. Why do you ask the question? Because every computer has a different computing power. It doesn't give you any information. It doesn't give you any information of the size of the attack uh, as we look at it. 
And I said, you don't get it. I'm not here to look at technical information. I'm making a political talking point right now because I specifically want to know how many people's homes or computers were breached by whoever perpetrated this. Uh, because each of those single events is a trespass or, or some sort of crime. And that gives me the number. So, so because I'm, I'm drafting a political talking point that should resonate in United Nations or EU or NATO. So we finally got there and said, we were attacked from 1 million computers in more than 100 jurisdictions, including Vatican. So, so that was the talking point I was drafting, and it's it's uh, it's a nice sentence to to, you know, drop into any political conversation at that time. I think, especially if you get the Vatican in there, definitely. I mean, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Again, that's the um, that's the difference, then I suppose between the people working behind the scenes, um, doing permanent secretary work like yourself, I suppose, the techies, and then the the face of it, which is the politicians, I guess. And we've got to find a way to bridge the gap, I suppose, in communication. Because also, then it goes it goes to the public as well, doesn't it? As you say, to to try and put it into language that people can understand. Yes, and it's wider than that. It's wider than politicians. It's also boards. It's also it's also supervisory boards or, or boards of directors and and, and the C suite. So one of the things that uh, that I think is desperately needed still is building that interface between technology and between uh, between the C suites or the boards or politicians. I think the road there shouldn't be condescending on, on the technology side and it shouldn't be it's a techie problem from the politicians or the, or the manager's side. And those types of um, live experiences, I have earned my daily salary, so I plug in the cyber range here. But, uh, but uh, for example, on, on the cyber range, we, we often give companies an experience. What does it feel to, to experience a cyber attack? So we set up a network and a company architecture. We put several teams to defend several architectures. But on top of that, very often, we put a board. And it's actual board that is sitting. So, so they actually get an understanding. What does it look like? What is our face to the world? Or, or what is the world-facing infrastructure that we have to deal with and, and defend? Uh, what is the office network that we have to protect and, uh, and enhance cyber, cyber uh, awareness? Uh, what, are, what is the security suit, some of the special systems, and how the, how the attackers may, may pivot between different, uh, different places? So, so we get that uh, knowledge live. And, and also show that to a large extent, our, the effectiveness of the response depends on your uh, reaction and, and your decisions. One very good example from, from a live exercise to bring that knowledge was that um, we orchestrated a, a, a cyber exercise, a, a system was breached, a critical service of a company, let's, let's call it any e-service, if you are in, in, in e-business, an online business, um, and the board was sitting there and the question was, you know, do we take the service down or not? Uh, information compromised, customer data, all those things. And the board was deliberating. There was not a standard procedure. It took them time to understand the problem first. But because of the, the time they spent, and by the time they said, let's take down the service, the, our red team had escalated. The privileges were already that high that all the admins of the company were kicked out. So the faulty service was now running. And what do you do now? Do you physically cut the cable? So this is something uh, that uh, the politicians, boards, uh, C suit uh, should understand is the, um, the the unpredictability of of some of the moves that that can happen in in, in cyberspace. Yeah, and the potential consequences. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, so just just to to go back on that then, cyber ranges. What what is a cyber range? Talk to us about that. Cyber range is a uh, an environment and platform where we can emulate business or special infrastructure. So we use a library, and library items can be uh, regular virtual machines, or they can be physical special systems that we connect to to what we call a game net or, or environment, and we set them up as organizations so you have your firewalls and uh, and you have your office network you have a security suit you may have cloud you may have uh, um, your 
customer service uh, segment. Uh, and on that, we we put um, actual you know uh, working different working software. So we 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 use the tools and uh, and, and and softwares that are normally used by uh, uh, by the by the company. And then we we can attack it or we can test uh, some sort of defensive uh, equipment on that before going live. We can exercise uh, how we how we defend this. We can take that infrastructure, multiply it between different teams, and uh, and we can have a great competition. So, for example, last week we had uh, a competition for European Union mill search. So we had 20 EU mill search, which is military cyber emergency response teams exercising uh, on our cyber range and basically trying to hunt for threats. Uh, so, so this is just one use of, of cyber range. You can... You can use it to test personnel. You can use it to, to to train them, to prepare them for the for the recent threats. Yeah, that's uh, this is what we do. It's it's hard to make a working cyber range. Um, there are there are very few of them. What we say sometimes is that we're in competition with PowerPoint presentations. So there are there are a lot of lot of people who say that we can do all that, but uh, actually it's it's hard in practice. We have worked on our range and on our automation, visualization, situa situational awareness uh, solution at the library for seven years now. So is that, is that something that you, you customize for, for each organization or you, pr you provide it as a sandbox for people to test things in? Both options. Uh, so um, first we say that, you know, why don't you take a look at our library? We have 2,000 items there. And, and perhaps and there's a great chance that a lot of them uh, are are usable that we already have in the library. The second point is, do you really need the whole organization being replicated for an exercise? And then what is that you want to do? So if you want to test out the new firewall, if you want to test out the new, I don't know, um, uh, anti-malware or, or logging uh, software, then then perhaps again, this would be an overkill. There are few instances where full infrastructure uh, replication makes sense. It is space, definitely. So if you're a space station, then you would like to have a full infrastructure because if you if you want to test equipment, especially defensive equipment, you don't want to try that out live. <laughs> so uh, so so there it makes sense to uh, to actually build and go and build the actual replica. It can be costly if there are not effective tools how to do that. So this is sort of penetration testing on steroids for an, for a whole organization really is uh, yes and uh, and also trying out uh, what it feels to to be under under uh, cyber attack it, 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 it and the, the simulation of like okay something is actually happening now how are we going to respond to it exactly mm -hmm. is there an assessment going on from both sides so on the sort of back end you're looking at you're you're observing that that hack or that attack taking place, and you know whether it's you or or the actual your client are doing things to to respond to that. And then the other side, are they looking for vulnerabilities in order to kind of patch them? So is there a kind of duality kind of assessment going on, or are you just saying right, let's look for vulnerabilities, and that's the only that's the only source of this exercise, and then we say what's our response to that? The, uh, there are various options. What what you can do, we are free, um, so we we offer all kinds of uh, of experiences. One, and this is right on point. Very recently, more popular types of uh, exercises and and requirements are dealing precisely with looking for vulnerabilities. So we call them threat hunting exercises. We set up a co company infrastructure and we go through the whole attack cycle. And I think this is very, very important. So we, we explain how they come in, how they gain foothold, how they pivot, uh, and how to look uh, for them, especially if it's a zero day. If, For example, if we, if we look at the exchange uh, event and then how they leave back doors, how we uncover those back doors. But there is no hardening going on but it is just to inform people of how things happen and uh, this is also very very helpful to combine with management because you have the whole sort of little mock-up 
uh, of a picture of your organization in front of you. You have it in a huge dashboard and you can actually explain, you know, this is, this is why cyber awareness is important. This is why the investment in the firewall is important. This is why this recent upgrade is important. And this is why it is important when Microsoft Exchange has zero day, we take down the organization for five hours and do the patches. Because we have actually had cases uh, with the recent exchange that um, IT personnel was afraid to go to the management to tell we need to take the system down for a while, and they uh, they actually lost uh, some um, some some valuable data because of that. Then you have the live fire. This is the other type of exercise that you described. So we build up an infrastructure. And we put a red team on it. We can invite the customer uh, representatives there as well, to uh, either to perform the offensive activities or or to 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 see how our people. We have our own red team, who who they do how they do it, and then um, or it can be customers red team as well, which is uh, not a rare uh, rare case. And then you would have to do the full defense. That's the most intense experience. So you have the infrastructure. You have to go and, and discover the vulnerabilities. You have to do the patches, uh, and it's it's great uh, for teamwork and uh, and again understands your the weaknesses within the organization beyond technical because what we ask our our participants in the exercises to do is to write situation reports and incident reports, and then we give them to the board or crisis committee of the company, and they need to assess it. So, and yes, the, sometimes the criteria to as, assessment is, do you understand it? Can you do something with it? Is there this so what argument? And, and, and that's why I say, when I go and blame, uh, you know, politicians of not understanding cyber, to some degree, the reasons politicians, lawyers, sees you not understanding cyber is, we also, on the technical, now I'm on the technical side suddenly, no, well, I'm somewhere in the middle, but on the technical side, teams often do not take or make the effort to also trying to explain what is going on so so that's also part of the exercise and an important important stuff yeah yeah and how long do these assessments i mean obviously they're going to vary but on average how long do these assessments normally take uh, a, a good threat hunting exercise would take you two days a good live fire exercise would go somewhere between two to three days. We have seen five day exercises. A good board exercise, uh, if, if we put the board or, or executive component there, we wouldn't get their attention for longer than two hours, but that's already very generous. If we could get them for two hours on, on, on top of technical exercise, that's good. But, but I think what is, what is changing now and, and what we want to change is we don't want to serve a menu. We want to give the customers the kitchen so so they could actually, and, and that's the reason, uh, customers are all different and we want the customers to be smart, to actually design their own experiences based on our library. But moreover, more importantly, we also want them to create content and be able to ch to sell that content also to other customers. So if you're a if you're a university and if you have a cybersecurity program and you have 50 students doing their research, we don't know what the research is. It, it can take us to some very interesting places. So we, we just want them to be able to have a cyber range. We want them to be able to have a bunch of targets to start with and then do their research and maybe develop new targets, implement new vulnerabilities and, and, and whatnot, and then be able to sell it to other universities because, uh, because um, sharing is caring. Absolutely. So it's, it sounds like you're approaching this from almost like a, a war games type scenario. I imagine that that's going to get a lot more buy-in from organizations that are going to want to get involved in that because it's it's entertaining, if not if nothing else. <laughs> it is. It is. And <laughs> it is also, I, I mean, we always be, believe that there has to be a, a fun element to that and excitement. And uh, it is about team building also and, and building that interface. And uh, one of the, um, always the, the greatest uh, moment for us uh, in any any exercise uh, has been that when we deliver a range to a client or, or when we deliver exercise to a client, and we have the visualization suited up. When the customer pushes us away, when the uh, when the senior personnel comes and starts briefing themselves and go go through it, and and, and that's the moment when you, when you see that the customer really 
owns it and uh, and when they when they are happy uh, about it uh, and, and they can explain it in, in their language in the way that their management understands and and it all starts to make sense so i think that's good i, I imagine it must be quite a visible learning curve you, you're watching them go through that process of you know going from very little understanding of they're probably just concerned about security at the start to actually wanting to engage understanding how they're engaging in it at the end of it and and how they can improve their business going forward i think that must be absolutely fascinating it is it's 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 it's, it's a good feeling i must say how are you then staying ahead of because you have this library which is obviously a great basis for for a lot of these attacks how are you looking f- for opportunities to build new elements to that library and also just be one step ahead of the game because it's forever evolving right oh my god yes uh, and and getting harder and harder all by by day my my job among other things is to write scenarios i am uh, some some sometimes call me chief storytelling officer and, uh, <laughs> i am <laughs> and and my job is to put the narrative on the exercise. I mean, it's a very technical exercise. It's a routine. Basically, you have a new vulnerability, you implement it. Our red team has actually come up with, uh, is, is, is pretty well informed, I, I, I must say, and we have good collaboration network. So we so we have an idea of the, of the vulnerabilities, but sometimes the, the sheer aggressiveness of the attacks that are taking place, the, the scenarios that play out uh, that you put on paper, are much worse than than I can I can come up with these days. I can give a couple of examples. In uh, 2017, I was pitching a scenario to a large international exercise where we had a lot of representatives from various countries, including UK, to do a scenario where a hospital is under ransomware attack. And what is the decision-making process and what is the technical response and what that could be? April 2017. And the host of the exercise says, no, 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 it's not realistic. This is, this goes too far. Let's, let's not go there. Now the situation is different. Again, uh, we did another international exercise. It was just uh, before the colonial pipeline. And it was exactly the same, ransomware attack against the critical infrastructure. We submitted the scenario on f- on Thursday, attack happened over weekend. The exercise was on 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 Tuesday, and said, "Guys, you're just copying what is happening in the real world. This is not original thinking." And and you know, the feeling that I get is that the real world is getting away from our thinking. But but I think it's just just something that we have to deal with. But but yeah, we of course we fell, follow the from the technology side, we follow the regular methods of uh, of, of of the attack structure and infrastructure, and then we, we participate in the forums. But uh, what I find difficult is that sometimes the way offensive cyber is being used these days, and and I think what many people don't realize is that uh, that it's everywhere that you do not have to do anything wrong to be a, a target of an attack. It's uh, un- un- unpredictable. Is there a getting ahead of the game? Because it feels like if you were to um, simplify a cyber attack down to a criminal activity, as a society, we're generally always behind criminals, you know, except for the ones that get caught. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, you know... Um, is there always going to be a case that there's, there's there's always going to be somewhere out someone out there one step ahead who's thought of something different? Because otherwise, we're planning for something that may never happen. I think that's true, and I think uh, I think that's the, that's how the world has always been. But I think a couple of things come to mind. A critical question is. How do we behave in a situation like that? What is our tolerance of failure? What is our our tolerance of risk? And what is our ability to think outside of the box? I was in a uh, I, I was in a seminar where we were discussing the future of cyber exercise, and we were given a task to teach an 18, 80 year old grandma basics of cyber security. And the task it was like a teamwork. And the task was, how would you do that? And everybody jumped into the uh, into the game, and then we were starting to plan. You know, how how do we teach that grandma? Well, I said, 
let's stop for a minute. And why don't we ask a question around and ask what that 80 year old grandma can teach us about cybersecurity? Her mistakes may inform us. Uh, what do we do when she makes that you know, stupid mistake? And how do we make sure that we actually learn and put that in practice? So um, again, this uh, the position of security experts being a little bit condescending and, uh, and not seeing, we must see intelligence opportunity, learning opportunity in every failure. We must have, and that should feed the tolerance of failure. If we, we, we see a ransomware attack, we shouldn't treat it as a terrorist dilemma or you know, moral dilemma of good and bad, we should treat it as an intelligence opportunity. What can we learn from here? How can we go after? And, and for example, if we take ransomware, I think we, we run the risk of um, losing a lot of data because of some of the posture that has uh, been, again, put forward by, by, by people involved. Uh, and and let, me, let me explain. Uh, so for example, ransomware hits, and we have run that also in some of our exercises. And the question is, do you pay? Mm. The question, do you pay, is not a binary choice. But in our, in our response, very often, it's treated as binary choice. And when you go to the yes column already, or the yes box, you are already a bad guy, and you are you know, paying to the terrorists and negotiating with hostage situation and, 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 and so on. Well, there are a couple of points. Legally, in our legal systems, ransomware is never treated in equal level of, um, of severity as terrorism or, or, or hostage situation. It's not, we, we, we call it in our country the first degree crime. It is not the first degree crime. This is just definitionally wrong. So if we want to treat it as terrorism or hostage situation, then we should first define it in the criminal law as, as terrorism or hostage situation. Maybe we should, but today we are not. You know, then second is that the payment can come in various forms. So it is not a secret that a lot of institutions are taking the risk by their the risk management playbook to take the risk of paying. And whatever uh, is being said on the moral side, they, they do it. Now, if we over-moralize the situation, these companies are not sharing data with us. And we are, we are just eliminating one discussion. We are eliminating a lot of, a lot of, a lot of data and we are eliminating a lot of, a uh, lot of ability to, uh, to discuss and, and go after them. Instead, I think we should be debating following things, which is, do we have a phone number in every, every national police where we can go? and call, make a safe payment, share the data, go after that, maybe build a database and apply some sort of algorithm to, to try to find out actually who is behind it and do those attributions. We saw that now first time in Colonial Pipeline. They actually did it. They actually made a fake payment. FBI went after that. And that was effective. It was in, enormously effective. And I think, I, I think these, this is the thinking that we should display if we want to stay ahead of the game. Do you think that there's other lessons that we can learn from how non cyber crimes have been tackled over the, I was going to say decades, but you know it, it, it is decades, I suppose. Are there lessons that we can that we can learn that we should be applying to how we deal with cyber? Yes, absolutely, and and I think we can we can uh, take parallels and again be creative uh, about it. I think. Uh, in certain drug wars have been, uh, I mean, people have been extremely creative and extremely successful. So, for example, our our company has been working in Colombia with Colombian defense uh, forces uh, for, for a long time. And uh, and we see how effective, for example, Colombia has been in uh, encountering the, the menace of uh, drug crimes. And again, how creative the country has been. I think there are lots of lessons learned from there. I think uh, experience in, in fighting corruption Again, um, lots of people uh, uh, compare, uh, and um, this ransomware is a bit of an obsession. Uh, but uh, but again, um, it's, it's just so bad. A uh, lot of people compare it to terrorism and hostage situation. It's not. Um, I, I I don't. I think it's a false equivalency. I would compare it to corruption, because uh, because somebody wants money 
uh, for for in an illegal way. That's that's much closer uh, to me to corruption. A bit like blackmail, I suppose, in a way, isn't it? And blackmail, blackmail, yeah. and exactly something like this. And uh, and again, we should use some of the tools and, and techniques that are used in fighting corruption and, and blackmail. It's uh, the toolboxes are also out there. Mm. And I think a lot of that will come down to back to, to the conversation we, we had uh, a, a few minutes ago where we're talking about um, that knowledge and that level of understanding of cybersecurity. But but th- I think it throughout the different levels, actually, because it's not just the getting it to the, the layperson in the public who's non-technical or the politicians or whatever, but probably within the industry as well, because you were talking about sort of cybersecurity experts talking down to people, but actually I think there's probably a lot of um, – developers out there building software without a full appreciation of the risks because i think from my from my perspective i know a little bit about cybersecurity I, you know enough to have an uh, have to be, to be fascinated by the conversation we're having but i think if i was if i were to try and do um the black hat is it black hat ha- hacker i think it is isn't it the um if i was to try and do that i don't think i'd be very good at it i mean we've had a, a hacker on the show before as well and um i just I, I worry that maybe even within the tech industry the developers the 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 uh the techies that are out there probably don't have the level of knowledge that they need to like h- how do we how do we get better at understanding the risks here uh, so I think the key here is to learn. I would be very, very interested in knowing when you're coding, you know, why, why you, why, do, why don't you care about that? And is it just, uh, is it the general way you are used to doing things? Is it uh, what needs to be changed? And I think we should take that premise in uh, in, in teaching cyber awareness that people are inherently not interested in this topic until and there's this it's not going to happen to me uh, approach and it's uh, makes life too complicated and and now i need to learn some extra things and there is certain resentment so what we have seen is lots of companies uh, implementing cyber awareness programs and and they are they don't seem to be working because they are mandatory we don't give people enough opportunity to vent out their problems and it's just another like they work like another powerpoint presentation which say you should use multi factor authentication every time don't put the, the the usb drive wherever you know you put it it's uh, it's just uh, it's sort of moses approach to cyber hygiene uh, doesn't seem to be working we had uh, a cyber awareness program that we that we designed for for a customer and by accident we left a feedback field open in one of the questions and uh, you know what happened it was an organization's organization which which had i think 5000 people in it and uh, 2000 people in cyber awareness course took time to respond to the comment and and they made a point that we are not going to follow that particular rule because we think it's stupid. And it was about USB drives. And, and you know what the rule, and, and the presentation said, you shouldn't be using USB drives given to you on trade shows because it may contain something bad. And 2,000 people out of 5,000 said, we don't care. We use that anyway. And now that's the learning moment. And I think this is what we should be thinking about in the cyber, in building cyber awareness courses, in building cyber trainings at all. Why people, why people do that? Where are those points of uh, of disagreement uh, with us? And they say, you know, it's my property. I I, I want to use it. And uh, well, this this particular organization didn't have too many ports open, but it was an interesting information. So I think every step of the way, when we do cyber uh, awareness and and build cyber awareness, we should be asking that question. And cyber awareness is not a technical issue. It is half Newton, half Freud. And it's, there's a lot of psychological and, and, and subconscious stuff going on, which we, which we also need to pay attention. Mm. I think for me, one, I do not understand hacking. I fundamentally do not understand how, how hacking works. So there's this 
anxiety brought on by the fact that I have no idea how something works and there's nothing and, and it's sort of far beyond my technical understanding to pr- be able to prepare for that, you know, or to under- to to code that, you know, when I'm writing code. I'm I'm a front end developer, so my my rules have always been if you're using forms, you know, that's really all I need to worry about as far as front end engineering goes. If you extend that onto sort of hosting and infrastructure, yeah, there are a few certain configuration things I can do. But really, I don't understand a lot of that. And the second aspect is sometimes it's just too damn convenient to use those USB sticks. (laughs) Yes, of course. The convenience versus, you know, whatever. And that's why Google make all their products free. It's because it, you lower the barrier to entry, you you get to farm all that data. You know that's why that's why these products are free. So it's just a combination of those two things means that I don't think I'm as cyber uh, uh, cyber security aware as I could be, and I imagine that's the same for a lot of other people. And 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 exactly, and and a lot of people are convenient, and, and and we are not going to change the human nature here, but but what we can do, and and, and what works sometimes is um, we can little bit step by step get into the subconscious of of people, and and sometimes the the role of those trainings is that you know maybe you don't need to be that aware in every step of the way but maybe then in this one moment when it really matters you actually think yeah i'm not going to check that link out then another one is that um, i think we should be making the point that if you are going through the cyber awareness course when you come out of it you are not going to be scared but you are actually informed what do i practically can do to make my life better and what kinds of tools I'm going to use that uh, I am, you know, uh, that, that my quality of life is not going to change. I mean, the, the safest way is just to shut down the computer and not use it and, and read a book. But, but that's not an option. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and and uh, w- w- what I find dangerous is that lots of cyber awareness courses are, are scaring people off. So there are these, well, I'm particularly against, uh, I'm really evangelically against phishing tests in large organizations. It teaches us absolutely nothing uh, because we know, I know that with a good spear phishing email, I'm going to get into their mailbox. Uh, or if I'm not going to get it, my, my red team is going to do that. The typical success of, uh, I think Semantic has put that out, 69% of phishing emails are going to, are, are, are successful. So um, I don't know, we should inform people that, you know, Let's just make it a, a show, or, or let's let's just present it in a different way, like a gamified way. Uh, show them a picture uh, of an email, regular email, and a phishing email, and, and let's collect points. How do you notice that this element in the email might might be phishing, might come from a malicious source, and let's reward them? But uh, but if you if you send out the link with a phishing email. I can tell the success rate of any phishing campaign that is offered. I think it's 69% up to 70%. We have done a phishing campaign that was um, 90%. I think it was 96% successful. And you know what we did? We sent out parking fines. It was a perfect parking fine. And you know who was the the most eager clickers on that email? People who didn't have cars. It's just uh, at 96% rate. But why do we need to humiliate these people in uh, by a training like this? My question is, what happens next once you have clicked that? In the in those trainings, what happens next is your screen is going to be is going to be blocked, and you are forcefully taken to a cyber awareness course, which you already hate because you feel humiliated. Then you click through it, and then you can go back to your work. I think this is the worst possible method of teaching. Uh, sort of teaching through humiliation doesn't get us anywhere. And then you, on top of that, you add you add a boring, you know, uh, PowerPoint. So. Uh, but what we should be looking is what do we do what do we do with people who have clicked on those links how do we encourage them to to come forward and say you know i i think i was hacked and 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 to tell them it's okay we have a plan we are going to deal with it thank you you actually enhanced the security of organization by sharing that information and being part of the community i think we should be focusing on that part 
But based on the conversation that we've had today as well, though, it doesn't feel like that, you know, the fishing thing, because that is like the predominant uh, view that most people have or, or, or get exposed to within an organization, especially non-technical people. Um, it doesn't feel like that is the thing that we should be worrying about at the moment. <laughs> phishing emails like it, it is it's still a vulnerability definitely but but there are bigger things to worry about right sure uh absolutely although i i, I wouldn't discount that threat because this is still one of the leading uh, ways to get into the system and pivot forward so uh, a lot of our scenarios start with uh, with this and then you can you can really do a lot of damage by by, by that but but of course the bigger things to worry about uh f secures mikko hyponen uh, made that uh, statement a couple of weeks ago we saw a first signs of it with Microsoft Exchange uh, Zero Day. And this is AI-enabled threats uh, that are, are surfacing and AI-enabled uh, attack vec vectors that are, that are coming up. Uh, so what happened, of course, in I don't know if you're, you're familiar, but we can walk through it very quickly. So um, Microsoft Exchange, one of the most uh, used corporate softwares, often faces Vulnerabilities. This is what what happens when you when when you do software. So there's, I mean, nothing particularly wrong with it. Now there was a zero day vulnerability that had been exploited by a sophisticated uh, actor. But as you are sitting in and, and you're gathering data, sooner or later you're going to be exposed. And and what happened? It was uh, I think in in Denmark uh, from a. Uh, large important financial institution when a danish security company performed the test and they found that zero day and and what a security company usually does when they find something like this they publish it and now the zero day is public the bad actor the really sophisticated bad actor exploiting the situation now is exposed and their game is sort of over but after exposing the zero day the other game and race starts. So what happens is Microsoft is forced to, or you know, has to issue a, a patch. And now this patch is going to be reversed engineered by the community of little bit lower level hackers, but still sophisticated. And then they try to start getting into the systems of uh, companies using this known vulnerability. Now, what we saw with Microsoft Exchange uh, attack was an AI-enabled ability to do that reverse engineering and to locate these zero-day vulnerable uh, organizations. So that was immensely, exponentially more wider than you could you could you could see in previous attacks like that when a zero day is, is is being exposed, and those organizations with these vulnerabilities are still out there. So this is something, and and there are there are other vulnerabilities that we are looking. That it doesn't have to be a corporate zero day vulnerability. There are there are other mistakes. There are misconfigured firewalls, uh, whatnot. So so I think this is one of the scariest challenge, and I think our ability to provide um, machine learning tools to counter that threat and our ability to let machine learning take decisions to counter this threat that in some ways has already manifested itself or at least is is, is giving signs to manifest uh, that, that is going to be one of the greatest challenges so i mean i uh, i've really enjoyed the, the arc of this conversation and I, I want to just uh, bring it back a little bit because the um, when when you were talking earlier about some of that um, that paper that was published around sort of late nineties, early two thousands, uh, Byzantine maze, the Byzantine maze, yes, that one. I, I'm I'm fascinated that that seems to that that that's such a pivotal point. One of the one of the best books I read was the the Cuckoo's Egg, which starts with uh, the security vulnerability and identified in Berkeley with an accounting error. I think it starts with yeah. yeah. Which I think we've made, we may have mentioned on the show before when we've been talking about about this sort of stuff. But I think um, it, it seems like if that's starting in the eighties, and then there's this big point at the the turn of the millennium, are we progressing <laughs> with our knowledge of cybersecurity at the rate that we should be progressing? Yes, yes, yes. I, I I don't want to be one of those who's who who tries to sell cybersecurity through fear, because I think it's not particularly effective. Although I mean. 
there are certain points where we we have to say that you know the risk is too high. We have to do something. But but we're doing a lot. I mean, uh, I think uh, certainly we see companies, Fortune 1000 companies, being much more responsible. Uh, of course, uh, I see two trends that can be drivers uh, for that change. Uh, one of them could be uh, insurance industry uh, because basically all insurance in future and and we see that trend to a large extent is going to be cyber insurance and our insurance premiums are going to depend on how good we are on cyber and that can be a significant amount and there is a debate if that is going to be significant or not but i think this 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 could be a factor uh, another thing is the shareholders our our own system of how we um, the system of fiduciary duty this is my lawyer again and we'll come back to the that's the that's the full arc now uh, the lawyer in me sees i mean the logic is that the, the company boards they need to be responsible they need to make money for for their shareholders and and if they do not act in uh, in a loyal and uh, and prudent way, uh, then they may face what is called derivative lawsuits. And and one of the things is lawsuits by their shareholders, even minority shareholders, for example. So what what we will see is uh, the same trends that uh, that has made so much difference in in other areas uh, of compliance or responsibility or liability that. Uh, that those shareholders themselves are also, as we teach people cyber awareness, they might be minority shareholders in our companies as well. So, so we we might actually prepare uh, their awareness also, uh, also in, in in terms of of corporate liability, which again is not a bad thing if it if it gets uh, if it gets us to a more safer space. I mean, I think that's a good note to end on. Is there any are there any are there any final points you want to? Any actually. And any final predictions you want to make for where we're going with cybersecurity? <laughs> <laughs> when when I look at the world, I I, I look at it at uh, in, in in three uh, sort of segments, and and one of them is, is the technology that we use, the things that we learn. I think we are going to see a much more awareness, a cybersecurity awareness, a lot more tools. And I think one of the questions actually is going to be how are we going to deal with our success, because because that's that's going to be an interesting thing to see when we look at the threat vectors things that we cannot control i think the whole metaverse uh, uh, discussion things that are happening in metaverse are going to to also have a cybersecurity impact uh, in an enormous way the way that we do not understand i think we are looking at this ai machine learning uh, uh, threats, but also uh, responses. And then the key question is, are we going to be prepared to do that? On the organizational, uh, the third third point is the organizations have that, 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 that structures dealing with it. I think we are uh, going to see a lot of cooperation beyond NATO, EU, and we are going to see a con con consolidation of like-minded nations uh, outside the formal alliances. And the very future of internet as we know it is going to be a big topic. I mean, uh, you see that Russia has successfully implemented uh, their sort of iron wall, uh, the China has implemented their, their firewall, how the network itself is going to look like 10 years from now, that's that's going to be an interesting thing. I think some nations are going to be much more aggressive, but but then again, I think corporations are going to be much more, much more responsible. And finally, there's the psychological aspect, the, the laziness, the convenience. I think we are going to see a lot more cybersecurity in our everyday lives. So we, we need to find uh, a normal way to do it. And and I think there are a couple of good ideas to do it. Certainly sounds like it. I think uh, I like the approach that you're taking with um, making it engaging. I think that's really important. So thank you very much for joining us on the show, Laurie. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you. Thank you for... Uh, for this talk it was it was really nice to be with you and thanks for having me well well that was uh laurie allman yeah amazing talk and really great to have met him and to be able to share our conversation with you mm. and next week we'll be keeping things topical again like i said uh continuing on with our cyber security theme as we talk to steve Oren, uh, Chief Technology Officer for Intel Federal. Yeah, we recorded this one recently and we thought we'd bump it up the order as we mm -hmm. talk about current threats to the world that are both physical and virtual and the role that Intel plays in advancing technology within the US federal government. 
Well, uh, we'll see you next week, as usual. If you like the show, give us a five-star review on Apple, please. Like us where you find us on social media. We're on, where are we? LinkedIn, Twitter. Yeah, give uh, us a wave on Twitter and head over to thattech.show to find all of our episodes. We've got plans uh, for the site there, so uh, keep checking. There's, we've, we've started adding some t- uh, transcripts for the show if reading is more your bag or you just wanted to quickly <laughs> reference something. Um, and if you have any recommendations or comments or thoughts, do drop us a line on the website or social media or, or wherever, you know. Let us know. So see you next week. <laughs>